We'll wait to see if people dial in. Hey, I think starting off with the first question on Afghanistan looks great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's Ask the Analyst session on China, Russia, a new great game in Central Asia. Today, we're going to focus on recent events in Afghanistan, but also think about China's foreign policy in Central Asia and the Middle East more broadly, taking into consideration the Belt and Road Initiative and tying it in, of course, to the China Britain Business Council, how that affects for example, UK companies that are paying far greater attention to the Belt and Road, either investing independently or working in a third market with a Chinese company. This is a very geopolitically driven part of the world and one where you really need to understand the local environment to, when considering investment decisions. So it gives me great pleasure to be joined today by Dr. Sam Romani, who is a tutor of international relations and politics at the University of Oxford. Um, who completed his DPhil in the same field earlier this March and is an expert on post-1991 Russian foreign policy with a particular focus on the Middle East, Africa and Indo-Pacific. Now, I'm aware that doesn't sound immediately like the perfect person to go to to discuss Chinese foreign policy um, in this area, but um, do keep an eye on Sam's Twitter and his career as he will probably be very embarrassed, but is no doubt um, a rising star in the foreign policy kind of watching world and is definitely my go-to person for anything to do with China, Russia, Afghanistan, that part of the world, you name it, um, he's got it covered. And his first book on Russian foreign policy towards Africa will be published by the Oxford University Press and Hearst and Co next year. Um, if you're interested in today's conversation and kind of some of the themes that we bring in to do with kind of Chinese peacekeeping um, and China's kind of activities um, in other parts of the world. Um, if you've already listened, Sam also was a guest on the China Business Brief, the CBBC's podcast last week, where we did a, a kind of separate deep dive on Afghanistan. Do that, do give that a listen if you have time, hopefully after today's session. Um, it would be sad if we were to lose you now. Um, some housekeeping rules before we start. Um, this session is basically it's supposed to be a seminar. It's very informal. Uh, if you have any questions on the latest events or curiosities about the Belt and Road in general, or very specific um, questions relating to your business and geopolitical um, ties and tensions in the region, feel free to click the raise your hand um, function and ask away. Uh, the format, I will start by asking Sam some general questions and then we will open the floor. Sam, welcome to today's webinar. It's great to have you joining us. Great to be here. Thank you, Joe. So this is a very topical, sensitive, dare I say, controversial, complex um, topic, and there's a lot we there's a lot of ground for us to cover. Um, I suppose the best place to start is how is China's foreign policy with regard to Central Asia, the BRI, looking now that the Taliban have returned to power in Afghanistan? Perhaps we could start by setting out the lay of the land, geopolitically speaking, between China, Russia, and the other key players in Central Asia concerning this development. So uh, obviously the uh, Taliban takeover of Afghanistan poses an immediate security threat to the countries of Central Asia. And uh, it's unclear to the extent to which the threat that we see today with regards to the spread of transnational terrorism across borders or even cross-border conflicts, those are two separate issues, is going to be equivalent to the level of threat perceptions that they had between 1996 and 2001, which is when the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan was first in power. But most Central Asian countries are certainly viewing the uh, events of, uh, of 2021 as basically 1996 in Redux, and they're basically seeing this as history repeating itself. And because of that, there's a lot of alarmism across the region and different strategies to approach it. And the strategies that these countries are pursuing are eerily similar to the ones that they pursued 25 years ago. 
even though the foreign policies of these countries have changed in the interim. For example, Turkmenistan was the uh, de facto fourth country to recognize the Taliban in 1996-2001, de facto because it never established official diplomatic relations, but it all but did in 2000. Now it is also choosing a, an approach of, of large-scale diplomatic engagement. For example, uh, a Taliban delegation visited Ashgabat in February to engage with Turkmen officials about the situation. So they're pursuing a course of diplomatic engagement. Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, and Tajikistan are largely pursuing uh, de deterrence under the Russian security umbrella. So back last time, Uzbekistan joined the Russian Collective Security Treaty Organization, uh, and then they withdrew after the immediate threat of Afghanistan was gone. So now they're back participating in drills, but short of a formal security alliance. We're seeing Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan carrying out similar drills, equipment uh, and material uh, transfers occurring on the uh, across borders. So they're engaging on a strategy that's relying a lot more on deterrence and cooperation, chiefly with Russia on matters of security. Of the Central Asian countries and their reaction to the events in Afghanistan, the one that's been a bit intriguing to me and a bit surprising to me is Kazakhstan, because Kazakhstan back in 1996 with Nur Sultan Nazarbayev as president was trying to take the lead, basically saying that uh, Afghanistan's a Central Asian issue. The Russians basically uh, completely uh, botched the situation with the Soviet war in Afghanistan. They shouldn't be here. This is not the natural playground of the Americans. The, uh, the, the Chinese really are, are kind of a, a nascent power here and they haven't really been that involved in the developments of the region as an order builder. We should be championing a Central Asian solution. Kazakhstan has been pretty much missing from action aside from uh, subtle passive cooperations with the Russians. That's the only reaction that's really surprising me that's, that's rather different from the past. So given the fact that Central Asian countries are viewing this as profoundly uh, disturbing development and are dealing with it either through deterrence or through diplomacy, this creates uh, immediate implications for, for China and their strategy. So China has been pretty happy so far to let the Russians basically take over the security responsibilities and the fallout from Afghanistan has instead been reinforcing the kind of diplomatic initiatives and the kind of language that Turkmenistan has been promoting, basically saying that the Taliban should be engaged with, not isolated, there shouldn't, there shouldn't be acid freezes and sanctions, and also laying the groundwork to potentially uh, working with or investing in a Taliban-controlled Afghanistan while stopping short of outright recognition. I think that that strategy will largely continue. They'll be happy to see the Russians uh, outsource uh, the security side of things, whereas China tries to mitigate and moderate the Taliban's conduct, in particular the support for the East Turkestan Islamic movement or the support for transnational movements through active diplomacy, probably working with the Turkmen's in that regard. So I see like kind of a Russia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan axis versus a China, Turkmenistan axis. These axes are relatively flexible though. So we have to we'll watch for changes going forward. Thanks, and that sets out the kind of the lay of the land for today's conversation really well. Uh, I think it also probably satiates people's initial desire to find out how China is feeling about Afghanistan and the developments there. And we will touch on that later. Right. Um, but as we did a podcast on that today, I really want to focus on the Belt and Road and the China-Russia relationship. And of course, you know, you've already touched upon the fact that China is willing to kind of let Russia seemingly take the lead in Afghanistan. Um, so looking now at the Belt and Road more broadly, because of course China is viewing Afghanistan through a prism of how it could potentially be integrated into its Belt and Road. The Belt and Road runs through Central Asia and it's an area which has traditionally been considered to be Russia's backyard, given the number of former Soviet states that constitute it. But it seems that Russia is relatively relaxed about China promoting the Belt and Road Initiative in its sphere of influence. I suppose the two questions there, and the first one is a bit of a cop out, but if we, a quick reminder to those of why the Belt and Road came into being what it is. And secondly, why Russia, in your view, is either interested or it is disinterested, which is how it appears from Beijing. Right, that, those are two excellent questions over here. Um, obviously, the Belt and Road was uh, unveiled by uh, Xi Jinping in September of 2013. And uh, it was uh, important to keep in mind that it really kind of captured the Central Asian consciousness quite early on, because Xi Jinping was discussing the strategic vision at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. And uh, that kind of uh, meant that the uh, Chinese and the Central Asians would effectively co constitute the belt side of the, uh, 
uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative, whereas the maritime areas around it and further south would constitute the roadside. So Kazakhstan in particular, but Central Asia more broadly, was kind of integrated into the Belt and Road almost immediately. And since then, the Belt and Road Initiative has really been quite sweeping in its ambitions and cutting across not just Central Asia, but also the South Caucasus. So pressing right against the front of the southern flank and the frontiers of Russia's sphere of influence. Um, the, uh, obviously, with regards to Central Asia, we're looking at and watching some of the uh, infrastructure and road movements that go through uh, major cities. So we're looking at Almaty, we're looking at Bishkek, we're looking at Tashkent. And uh, basically, Tashkent is kind of like a fork in the road in some ways, because the, that, that connects the Belt and Road towards the Caspian Sea, and then also it can connect the Belt and Road from approximately towards Turkey and Iran. But the long-term goal of the Belt and Road in Central Asia is to really provide something of a bridge between the Middle East, the Mediterranean, Eurasia, and uh, continental Europe. So that's what we should be looking at more broadly. With Tashkent having perhaps an exceptional uh, logistical role and Kazakhstan having this kind of symbolic role simply because of how and where the Belt and Road in Central Asia and the strategies were developed. It also extends towards the South Caucasus too. And uh, we're looking, for example, at Wang Yi's 2019 visit to Georgia. That was quite significant. Georgia is, is being viewed as a transfer hub uh, uh, and its ports are viewed as being particularly valuable for transit between the Europeans and the Asians. And it's also important to keep in mind that Georgia's role as a transit hub is not just confined to uh, the uh, Chinese. I mean, the, uh, the Emiratis in particular, Sharjah Emirate, have also been investing quite heavily in port infrastructure there in conjunction with what DP World is doing. So they're looking at it in a very similar way. The Europeans are obviously looking at Georgia in a very similar way with regards to Eastern partnership, economic integration, uh, trying to dilute uh, Russian uh, hegemony there and trying to promote sovereignty there. So uh, in the South Caucasus, China's got a bit more competition than it might have in the mainland of Central Asia. But clearly, Central Asia is being viewed as part of a broader Eurasian strategy. And this Belt and Road in Central Asia and the South Caucasus is being viewed as a real link between the Caspian, between the Middle East, between the Mediterranean and continental Europe with various capital cities playing an important role and Urumqi probably acting as a starting point. So that's just an initial overview of what the Belt and Road looks like in terms of economic and in terms of connectivity terms. Perhaps later on, we can discuss more about specific projects and uh, the security side of things. With respect to how uh, Russia views the Belt and Road, this is an interesting uh, uh, question to answer because Russia obviously has official and unofficial positions in the Belt and Road. Officially, Russia regularly defends the Belt and Road Initiative against uh, criticism, for example, against the Western criticisms about debt trap diplomacy, or about the Western criticisms that these railways are not really aimed at promoting inter-regional connectivity between countries and improving their infrastructure. It's more about promoting Chinese interests and kind of superimposing those interests on Central Asian countries. And issues like sovereignty violations, some of the land uh, say sale deals, which are particularly controversial in Kazakhstan. Russia's Russian state media outlets, if not Russian officials, have generally strongly de defended the Belt and Road and done what about them. So they effectively say, okay, China's at least investing in the development of these regions. The West, the Europeans, the Americans, they're the real neocolonial powers. And they're just projecting those uh, insecurities and that sense of guilt onto China. And that solidarity has been quite good for the Sino-Russian bilateral relationship, though it's been somewhat one-sided. We see a lot more defenses from Russia and Russian state media of Chinese conduct. And you see of China defending the, uh, some of the dodgy or some of the uh, inappropriate things that Russia might do. So for example, China did not condone the annexation of Crimea and actually established closer ties with Ukraine in the year afterward, particularly in the agriculture sector. And uh, the Chinese also uh, were neutral in the 2008 war in Georgia. So, there's a one-sided solidarity here, but the Russians are viewing this as a way to kind of uh, appease China rhetorically. Another plank that came from my visits to Moscow and has also been articulated as part of Russian strategy is the integration between the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, which is the Russian-led customs union that was founded in 2015. And it includes uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a, customs union that's led by Russia as an alternative supranational economic organization. And when I met with the uh, director of the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, the former uh, prime minister of Armenia, Turkan Sirkisian, I spent a, an hour talking to him about contingencies on this in his office a few years back. 
he was basically making it look like these two institutions would cooperate as something of a marriage of equals. So the BRI and the EAU would be signing up a major uh, a trade and investment pact. He claimed it was imminent. It took several years to even get off the ground, but he claimed it was imminent and he claimed it would actually be like a foundation for win-win uh, cooperation with Russia and China as peers working together. In practice, the Belt and Road has been much more successful in terms of the constitution of projects, whereas the EAEU has stalled. They hoped that they were gonna to get Tajikistan and uh, possibly even Uzbekistan into their fold. They've had no new members really since 2015. And uh, intra-regional trade during the first two years of their existence, particularly for coming from Kazakhstan, which is an important cog in it, actually dropped because of the impact of Russia sanctions and the spillover effect on the, uh, the other countries in that region, particularly Kyrgyzstan, which relies on remittances and other countries which rely on the Russian market. So what a marriage of equals in the, uh, between the Belt and Road and the Eurasian Economic Union has devolved into a very much an asymmetric partnership with China having all the, basically most of the cards and the economic advantages and Russia be looking second tier increasingly in their own sphere in terms of trade volumes and investment volumes. So that beggars a question. Will the solidarity that we're seeing between Russia and China in the Belt and Road just become rhetorical and just become a means of shoring up the broader bilateral relationship and not have much substance to it? And will this uh, junior partnership status that Russia resents anywhere in the globe, and especially in its own region, cause tensions between the Sino-Russian relationship? My guess is that the collapse of this marriage of equals will mean that Russia will be less relaxed and probably more alarmed, if, if not publicly, about China's Belt and Road Initiative going forward. So that's just a brief lay of the land on how I see this whole, that, that complex question that Joe just laid out. Sorry, it was quite complicated, but that was a remarkably thorough answer. And I'm actually quite happy that we're recording this so that I can revisit it tomorrow to and kind of take, take notes. Um, I mean, it's interesting that you paint the relationship as an asymmetric partnership. And it's certainly an area which is garnering a lot more attention, the broader China-Russia. Um, relationship and I think lots of lots of scholars have written lots of good stuff on how it is one of the world's most kind of misunderstood relationships there is it was a very good piece written by Jude Blanchett in the Wire China I think earlier this week um, about people's desire to conflate Soviet Russia with current China and to um, you know present this as an axis that's competing with the America with America to be kind of like regional hegemon um, in Central Asia, in the Asia Pacific region even, um, because of course Russia stretches out kind of like just north of Japan, borders of China. Um, but it is appearing that increasingly it is a less consequential actor in the region compared to China, which I suppose begs the question, how is China faring in managing its relationships with the smaller actors along the Belt and Road? And that's, you know, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and then we can kind of turn our attention to a very important, but perhaps larger actor in, in Pakistan. Is it, is it doing anything in your mind particularly um, successfully um, to cater to the needs of these smaller, but very important players, given that they all play a defense um, and kind of hedging role in, in the region's geopolitics? Well, definitely. I think that uh, China has been focusing a lot on the smaller actors within the region. Uh, just to give you a very brief uh, kind of overview of how I just uh, tie this back to the broader Russia-China partnership, as you mentioned it, I definitely see the asymmetric partnership being something of a, a, a bit of a problem uh, because Russia is uh, so preoccupied with international status these, these days and recognition is a great power. It's craving recognition from China that it doesn't get from the West. So if it doesn't get that, it's going to be potentially creating a friction. And more broadly, there is a bit of a division across the globe in how they handle international affairs. Obviously, the Chinese Belt and Road is predicated on the stability of the international order. And that sometimes even trumps uh, a democracy or authoritarianism, whereas Russia may be a lot more doctrinaire in terms of promoting an authoritarian regime or an anti-Western regime. So China is a lot more willing to adapt to geopolitical circumstances like the Euromaidan revolution in Ukraine, or take an African example, the 2019 Sudanese coup, where China just seamlessly adapted to those developments, whereas the Russians try to preserve the status quo with private military contractors or in Ukraine and outright military intervention and prioritized uh, kind of their ideational views and their, and their own kind of narrow security interests over the broader regional stability. And that's a problem. More broadly, I think they're looking a bit like well, this is a phrase that I used at a speech at Harvard last year. I advanced the idea that they're looking more and more like competitive partners, 
So partners in the normative sphere, partners in terms of free space, expressing solidarity with each other, greater integration between their multilateral institutions, but in practice competing for local contracts and uh, having markedly different national security and grand strategies that could become in collision with each other. And the collision might not necessarily be in Central Asia or be in the areas right near their borders, but the collisions could be further afield in the Middle East, in Africa, in Southeastern Europe, in South Asia, where these two countries are rising powers. So that's just how I view the broader China-Russian relationship in case that would be interesting for people asking questions. Now turning to the second part of the question, which I think was the crux of what uh, Joe was trying to uh, discuss here, is China's relationships with the smaller states in Central Asia. I think that China's relationship with Tajikistan is particularly important and worth watching, particularly in light of the current scenario in Afghanistan. And uh, Tajikistan is a country that's been probably more than any other within Central Asia, within the Russian thumb. It's relied, uh, some people say, between 35 to 50% of its economy comes from uh, Russian remittances. But China has been involved in kind of developing the Pamir's region. They spent, uh, they, for example, 204 million in terms of roads, followed by another 360 million in 2019. They've been involved in the construction of highways, like, you know, all, all across the country. So that it, even in mountainous areas. So that's been uh, quite important. And the objective is really to link Tajikistan to Xinjiang. So we should watch what they're doing in terms of infrastructure in Tajikistan. That's an important dimension of it. China has also periodically been involved in Tajik security since 2015 or 20, 2016, I think it was made more public. China has been actively training security forces in Tajikistan. And then they also held drills in 2019, kind of launching off their broader security presence in Badakhshan, which the Russians did not publicly criticize but Russian commentators certainly, and Russian media certainly viewed as a bit of a step on their toes, a bit of a movement too close to home. So the Chinese are, are an important partner to the Russians because the Russians provide remittances and they provide security to the 201st military base and 7,000 troops, but they don't have the capital to really develop Tajikistan's infrastructure and economy. And it's important to keep in mind that much like Afghanistan, Tajikistan's infrastructure and their civilian economic uh, output was raised to the ground effectively by a five-year civil war from 1992 to 1997. So any more regional insecurity would make that worse. And China is really the last best hope to kind of rebuild and to kind of have prosperity. With respect to Turkmenistan, obviously Turkmenistan is the world's fourth largest exporter of natural gas. Turkmenistan is an important energy partner. And they turned to China earlier on than most other Central Asian countries. And that was because Russia and Turkmenistan had a major gas dispute when Dmitry Medvedev was president about pricing, and that effectively isolated Russia from the Turkmen gas markets. Turkmenistan has the luxury of kicking out Russia because it has a doctrine in its foreign policy of permanent neutrality that was adopted by its founder, Sefer Murat Niyazov, commonly known as Turkmen Bashi. He basically argued that uh, Turkmenistan should neither be part of the East or the West or the Russian bloc or the, uh, or, or the Chinese bloc, though it is part of the SCO, he basically was kind of talking about that. Yeah, like basically as, as a, a neutral country. So the fact that they are not to bond, bonded into Russia so closely means that they can work on uh, engagement with China and the natural gas sphere, and they can carry out uh, natural gas and transit routes between the, uh, the two countries. Um, it's uh, a bit opaque as to exactly the extent of Chinese investments in the long term in Turkmenistan outside of the energy sphere, but we've definitely seen uh, science to watch with Wang Yi's trip to Ashgabat. So we should keep an eye on that. And I think that probably, whereas in Tajikistan they're working on roads, I think here they're probably working more on pipelines in a similar kind of connectivity format. Turkmenistan obviously has the TAPI project, which is kind of linking Afghanistan, Pakistan, India bridging to South Asia. So any Chinese investments in pipelines will link Central and South Asia together. So that's something that's worth watching. Kazakhstan, they have a lot of investments, but it's uh, mostly, I already talked about them mostly through the context of the Belt and Road. So we can skim over that unless somebody has any kind of pressing or particular questions. With respect to uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, it's obviously a strategically important country. Uh, their investments are relatively smaller in scale than in other countries, but the uh, 2016 a terrorist attack on the Chinese embassy in Bishkek really exposed Kyrgyzstan's insecurity. And China has been combining something of a soft security footprint through the use of private security contractors and private security companies and more active cooperation drills with the Kyrgyz government 
as well as its usual mix of uh, infrastructure and economic investments. So, and China's most significant long-term projects probably relate to this China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan railway project. So that's something that we should be watching more closely. And it's been a little bit solid since the pandemic, but there were a lot of active discussions about it in 2019. And the production of that project was used as a justification for why China was sending private security personnel in the first place. So on the hierarchy, Turkmenistan is the most important for immediate economic profit. I think Tajikistan is probably more important in terms of long-term investments, but Kyrgyzstan's importance should not be entirely discounted. I feel really guilty now because I forgot how many countries there are in Central Asia. And then you've gone through, and I, I also feel like somebody should bring you a cup of tea, but unfortunately this is happening over Zoom, and um, so yeah. that, that won't be. Um, but to give you a bit of a respite, I will you know, just remind people, if you have any question that you want to raise and put to Sam, you know, do write in the chat box. We have one already, but as that's on Afghanistan, we can turn to that towards the end of the conversation. But if you have any particular questions on the Belt and Road or anything that we've discussed so far, do put that, you know, do put it in the chat box. Um, you, this is a great opportunity to have Sam answer questions and you can be as mean as you like with them. I've been really, I feel, I feel guilty that questions I've put so far have been really challenging. Um, sorry. Um, but I mean, you mentioned the, the Shanghai Corporation Organization, which of course is a China, China-led uh, institution. I suppose it's an institution that doesn't get much attention in the business world. It's not business focused per se, um, but do you feel that's played a role in enabling China to successfully go out with the Belt and Road and to not dominate, but subjugate Russia underneath it in this asymmetric relationship? That's a really interesting question. So just to give a bit of an overview about the Chinese, uh, sorry, about the China Cooperation Organization. It was founded originally as the Shanghai Five in 1996. And that was kind of what it was. And that it really kind of came to being in its current incarnation in 2001. It largely was formed because of all the unresolved uh, border disputes that were really being held between, uh, between Russia and Central Asian countries. And it wanted to create a scenario that none of those border disputes, particularly between you know, Russia and Tajikistan, I, that was one of the ones that was most salient. And there's always a lot of uh, uh, unrest about smuggling and uh, organized crime and trafficking and other problems on the Kazakh Kyrgyz border to the point to which when pandemic came in, the Kazakh media started blaming Kyrgyzstan for bringing it in. I mean, there's a lot of politics around that. But the point is that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has served as an organization that respects state sovereignty, confirms the inviolability of state borders and does not lead to any kind of uh, interstate conflict. And secondly, it kind of uh, creates an apparatus for all the countries in the region to be cooperating against the threats of separatism, against the threat of extremism, against the threats of terrorism, the three evils of the SCO. Um, in particular, this was relevant because Russia had its own experience with Chechnya and that Chechnya experience had ties to transnational terrorism, the Wahhabi donations, foreign fighters, uh, movement of, of uh, of money and, uh, and arms from, uh, from Chechnya via Afghanistan was something that was important. The Afghans, Islamic Emirate, uh, endorsed Chechnya independence. Chechnya also had a relationship with the Taliban back in the day, but then they kind of claimed towards the very end in 2001, as the Taliban got more and more criticism that that relationship never existed. So that's a little ambiguous, but it was aimed at really preventing separatism, preventing transnational terrorism. That was of immediate concern to Russia. And it was more of a long-term concern towards China because of the uh, Xinjiang issue and the Chinese Islamic population and some of the issues with that. So keeping borders secure, uh, creating a common footprint to deal with these uh, shared security threats. And thirdly, was really creating a, a national security and international security organization that would uh, be a, a part of the multipolar world order. So the Russians with the Yevgeny Primakov, right? Uh, he was a foreign minister of Russia from 1996 to 1999 really talked about this consensus-based world order. So US unilateralism is uh, creating instability. It's reckless. It's undermining international security. It's arguably the biggest threat to international security. And that was his view after the war in Kosovo. So in order to act as a check on the United States, in order to act as a check on Western powers, we need to create an alternative security block that can kind of uh, act as a, as, a, as, a, as a forum to kind of express our own views in a coordinated fashion. And then in the long term, if the UN Security Council expands or in UN debates with Russia and China being P5 members, 
can act as a veto or a check on American unilateralism. So that was the other reason why this SEO developed. And fourthly, I think it was really a way of kind of creating a relationship between Russia and China that was a relationship of equals. Because in the late 1990s, Russia's economy and Russia's uh, strategic position was as absolute nadir with the ruble crisis, with uh, more than uh, nearly a decade of economic contraction, hyperinflation and his legacies. Uh, Boris Yeltsin and Jiang Zemin wanted to kind of form something. And the Russians were really keen on having an organization where they would be seen as equals in it and an important participants in it at a time when their power was atrophying and China was uh, rapidly ascending as a rising power. And that still exists to the current day. So the member states, I misspoke before. I said Turkmenistan was a member state of the SCO. Sorry, it's actually a regular guest attendee that's an unofficial dialogue partner. So it's not a dialogue partner officially, it's unofficial. But the major member states are uh, Russia, China, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, uh, I believe it's all the Central Asia countries, but Russia and China, India and Pakistan. And uh, their observers are Iran, Afghanistan, and Mongolia. And they have dialogue partners in, across the world and they engage with other countries like, uh, like Turkey uh, in periodically in various forms. So they're an organization that really is trying to be a Eurasian organization, but also an organization that includes those non-Western powers or those middle powers that are trying to challenge the West like Turkey and Iran. So that's something to, uh, to pay attention to. I would say that in terms of agenda setting, even though it is about multipolarity and it is at least on the Russian side about creating a forum where they look like equals to China, is China still calling the shots? I mean, the Shanghai Cooperation Forum uh, Security Organization on Afghanistan, which is their most significant efforts, are really led by China. Russia kind of plays a subordinate role. The uh, agenda setting and the normative discourse is very similar across countries, but it's really more of a Chinese uh, uh, discursive sphere. The Russians have their own uh, security organization, the like Collective Treaty Security Treaty Organization, which functions a lot more like NATO. So SEO has got dialogue, but doesn't have security guarantees. This one has security guarantees and desire to protect it. And Russia projects power mostly through that organization rather than the SEO. So I would say that it gives Russia stature, but it hasn't done nearly enough to give Russia true parity and true equality with China, which given the asymmetries that I mentioned earlier, could in the long term be a problem. So that's how I just want to explain the SEO in a very brief format, because I don't think that many people have looked at it. Quite a niche organization. I mean, but, but especially as the UK is not, or any other kind of European state is not really involved in, gets perhaps overlooked, but I think is um, very influential um, in how it's one of the main foreign policy instruments I think that China is using to protect, to protect rather its interests along the BRI. Um, just as we touched on it briefly just now, uh, we have a question from the audience that I think is worth just addressing quickly, although obviously it's a broad question that's going to be hard to really kind of like nail in, in the space of like two to three minutes. Um, we've looked at kind of Russia from kind of Beijing's perspective, but how do you think that Russia is looking towards China? Is it as kind of, I think perhaps in the West, we position it as a kind of a lauded friend? Is it a potential enemy, a disruptor to Russian hegemony in the area? Or is it just some, a country that's too big to ignore and the legacy stretches too far back um, that Russia is forced to engage with, with China? How do you kind of conceptualize the Russia-China relationship? That's a great question. I think that uh, in some ways, you know, the three choices that you give, there's a little bit of all three of them in the answer. So it's kind of a a bit of an ambiguous uh, one to look at. I would say that Russia-China relations have really been consistently on the upswing since the late 1980s, really since Mikhail Gorbachev became general secretary. And that was when some of the uh, major disagreements that caused a lot of problems in the Sino-Soviet relationship began to get resolved. First and foremost was the ideological relationship. China's uh, ideological exporting to the third world after the 1970s became uh, a lot more, a lot less significant in terms of just being purely about ideology. So for example, from 1976 to 1985, it's um, arms sales to prospective ideological clients to Africa dwindled. And I think that's a litmus test for the broader policy. Instead, China sometimes is an adjunct to the United States and more often independently, tried to act as either a third partner or carving out a third way or a check on Soviet influence. So, for example, in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan, for example, it, it, it opposed the Soviet intervention. That would be the most notable intervention in, 
in Central Asia, and that's a trend that you see elsewhere in Angola, in Zimbabwe, other countries. I think mostly Southern Africa and Central Asia are really where that trend was observable to the greatest extent. Um, as well as the Persian Gulf too. I, I would guess uh, when Saudi to South Yemen briefly flirted with uh, Chinese influence in the 80s, that would be an example too. Yeah, so uh, the uh, so when, once the uh, rivalry went from being a primarily ideological rivalry to a strategic rivalry here, it uh, led to the foundations for longer term cooperation. And that cooperation really led to the Treaty of Friendship and Good Labor and in, in 2001. And from there, the relationship has really kicked off and really improved. So I think that the core adversarial, so calling it an enemy, that, that third spoke on the wheel has really sort of faded and there's generally committed towards a long-term partnership. This is not as brittle as many people in the West say. This is not a partnership that you can just draw a wedge between Russia and China. That's not to say that you can kind of treat them as like this kind of monolithic block or this kind of common threat, but you should try this room for selective engagement with China and probably because it's more of a destabilizer, less room for this between selective cooperation with Russia, but they're, the, the, they're not really gonna be divided by an external force anytime soon. This relationship is not gonna atrophy anytime soon. I want to make that point clear because there's a lot of talk about this in the uh, Western media uh, ever since the national security strategy of the United States really became great power competition and confronting these two powers at once uh, during the Trump administration. Um, I would say now that I've just kind of given out a layout of how, why I believe the relationship is going to endure, I think that the Russians view China as an indispensable partner, obviously, since the collapse of the uh, Russian relationship with the West in 2014 and the imposition of sanctions, uh, China is an indispensable uh, purchaser of Russian energy. They have a $400 billion gas deal. They have numerous uh, pipeline infrastructures that come together. That, that uh, economic partnership is gonna endure for at least 25 years if you look at contracts probably longer than that. The security partnership is also going to strengthen at a bilateral level. I think it was very significant that just this past month, the Russians were kind of using Chinese naval facilities, Chinese using Russian weapons. There were a lot more interchanges there in terms of drills. Russia and China are cooperating with each other in the security sphere, in Indian Ocean security and anti-piracy and maritime security more broadly. Look at their drills with Iran, look at their drills with uh, South Africa, for example. And they're also cooperating inside Central Asia, but to mitigate the threat uh, coming from Afghanistan. So terrestrial and naval cooperation is here to stay. So I think that that's gonna be there in the long term. The uh, potential areas of disagreement, and they also vote together on most major crises in the, in the United Nations. Though not always. Though China supported the Saudi led military intervention in Yemen, for example, the Russians uh, uh, opposed that. Um, the, uh, the Chinese views on Libya have sometimes been different, but, uh, on Afghanistan, on in, this, in the Eurasian sphere, sticking to that region generally, there's been a sense of agreement. So there's been uh, a lot of cooperation in those areas. Where the contestation and where the disagreements might emerge, I would say, is uh, in the context of Russia being a, a destabilizing force sometimes, rather than China uh, prioritizing stability, I already mentioned that. And also in terms of China overstepping on Russia's toes. So Chinese private security companies have been causing a lot of alarm in Russia. For example, there were headlines in Russian state line media outlets like Lenta, for example, saying red and dangerous to kind of show the uh, Chinese uh, uh, private security uh, presence over there. And even China's building of overseas naval bases as far as field of Djibouti have been seen as a litmus test for what China might be doing inside uh, the, the post-Soviet space. So when they saw the base in Djibouti, they didn't see an isolated installation that China wasn't even calling a base. They saw, well, this is going to be the first of maybe half a dozen or a dozen bases. Some of them are going to be in Badakhshan. Some of them are going to be right on our doorstep. And this is something that we have to counter and deal with. So, and also said the Chinese uh, Pakistan Economic Corridor, the CPEC project has also been seen as something that's been infringing on Russia's sphere influence at times, even if Russia publicly defends it. So China is the expansionist is the narrative that alarms the Russians and Russia is the disruptor is what alarms the Chinese. And the China's an expansionist narrative is really alarming to the Russians because of right-wing populist discourse about the so-called yellow peril, like that's what they call it in the Russian discourse. I mean, China, large numbers of Chinese populating Eastern uh, Russia, the Russian Far East and Siberia has been a long-standing conspiracy theory that the, that the Russian right has stoked and advanced uh, ever since the early 1990s. So entry into the, uh, the post-Soviet space, entry into Central Asia, these expansionists, these large-scale projects are also seen as just a stepping stone to the colonization of Russia. 
So there's a lot of domestic politics, a lot of conspiratorial rhetoric, there's a lot of unrealistic expectations that are at play here that are causing tensions, but those tensions are still there. And moreover, the legacy of the uh, Sino-Soviet split still endures in large parts of the former third world. And when you look at their public health campaigns, Russia has not adopted the Chinese vaccine. China has not adopted the Russian vaccine. They've done ca countervailing and often competitive contractual efforts. Their efforts in spheres of nuclear energy in terms of mining, uh, China made act as a, uh, Russia made act as a protector, I mean, of some Chinese economic assets, but even that's sporadic. Like Mozambique is more of an exception rather than the rule. In most cases, they are pursuing competitive contracts. Though China's got a lot more uh, money to bring to the table, so it's an asymmetric competition, but it's still a, a rivalry nevertheless. Also, I would say the uh, Chinese model of governance uh, based on the Chinese Communist Party and Russian sovereign democracy, they're promoting a common challenge to Western liberalism and alternative to Western liberalism too, but they rarely ever really praise each other's systems when they're promoting their models of governance. They rarely use each other's facilities in terms of uh, ports and in terms of uh, emerging naval infrastructure. So there's a lot of situations where China and Russia actually self-serve on each other and they might free ride off each other, particularly in the security sphere, rather than genuinely cooperate. And that is a problem beyond the historic myth, historical myths and this notion of uh, Russia as a disruptor and China as a potential colonist that I was talking about before. So that's a broad-based lay of the land of the Sino-Russian relationship. It'll endure, but it does certainly does not have um, a fully harmonious uh, future moving ahead. I mean, thanks for that. I think it's definitely attracting more attention, particularly I think people were very interested in the fact that China and Russia conducted military exercises together a couple of weeks ago, but I think a general in the PLA then announced had been the most successful for decades. And you know, the role of using kind of security and you know, maintaining public order in Central Asia as a foreign policy instrument, I think is one that shouldn't be overlooked. I remember when I was in Uzbekistan a couple of years ago, which again also borders onto Afghanistan, that even though this was a country to the country that is kind of coming out into reform and opening up to the world, there was still that fear that perhaps, you know, terrorism could seep, you know, south um, and disrupt its progress. Um, and, you know, the fact that China is through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization driving a kind of message of, you know, countering ter terrorism, insurgency, regional stability is an attractive one. If we, we have a second question from, uh, this time from Stephen, if we kind of pull back, kind of, pivot away from the kind of minutiae of China-Russia relations and back to the kind of Asia-Pacific, sorry, Asia-Pacific, too many talked about Asia-Pacific recently, Central Asia. Um, right. Question from Stephen is, Sam, you began your talk by saying that Kazakhstan has not been the leader in Central Asia, but it has been in the past. Do you think that this has been the lack of a really strong leader in Kazakhstan since the retirement of Nazarbayev? What, what would you be your answer to that? That is an interesting question. First of all, it's impossible to really tell exactly how much power Kazim Jomar Tokayev, the new president of Kazakhstan, actually has in the sphere of foreign policy. Nazarbayev was always the predominant uh, architect of Kazakh foreign policy, and he still maintains a prominent uh, unofficial position within the Kazakh government. So it's very possible that uh, foreign policy is still being dictated by, by Nazarbayev. Domestic policy might be uh, dominated somewhat more by Kotayev, but, but, but I'm sure that Nazarbayev has a hand in there too. Their exact relationship and the exact nature of that abrupt succession process, which occurred in March of 2019, kind of out of the blue, with only three months to give Tokayev experience as an acting president. I mean, that is something that uh, is noteworthy that, that we should know about. And also, it's important to keep in mind that before this, Tokayev's experience was really not in the sphere of diplomacy. He was a prime minister, but he also was primarily working in legislative bodies like the Kazakh Senate. And the Kazakh Senate was really a rubber stamp for the Neurotan party, which is the governing party of Kazakhstan uh, on legislation. So he was more of an implementer. He was more of a, a doer rather than a real strategic thinker about Kazakhstan's role in the world. So he's relatively inexperienced on this, but Nazarbayev may be still calling the shots in the foreign policy sphere. So the leadership transition is just one of several variables that's causing Kazakhstan's retrenchment. I think the biggest reason why Kazakhstan is less involved today than it was back in the late 1990s is because of a change in the Central Asian regional order. During the mid 1990s, the prevailing concern within Central Asia that was shared by almost all the Central Asian states 
was the overwhelming uh, dominance of Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan had a hard edge totalitarian dictator, Islam Karimov, and also it was the largest country in the region by population. It's got around 30 plus million people. Uh, Kazakhstan's got around 20 million, every other country is smaller than that, and significantly smaller than that. So Uzbekistan was viewed as the dominant hegemon in the region potentially, and other countries needed to check against that. So to prevent Uzbek dominance, it was incumbent upon the second largest country in Central Asia, Kazakhstan, to assume a much more aggressive and assertive posturing in terms of leading a Central Asian solution on core issues. And Afghanistan was one of those most important issues. Now with uh, the death of Primov in 2016 and the integration of Shavar Kat Mirzioyev, who's really tried to make, uh, build bridges with his neighbors, try to present a mo more moderate form of autocratic rule and try to downplay some of the most hard edged and aggressive elements of Uzbekistan's foreign policy, other countries are a lot more willing to work with, or at least even if they don't trust Uzbekistan fully, not see Uzbekistan as that kind of looming threat. So Kazakhstan doesn't have the need to kind of be so assertive as it was in the past. I think that the change in the Central Asian regional environment, in addition to the leadership transition, might be the biggest change. Moreover, Kazakhstan's foreign policy has become a lot more diversified than it was during the mid-1990s. They are trying to establish a, a de facto EU association agreement. They're engaging in trade with the West. They have a security alignment with Russia, but as I said earlier, Kazakhstan saw its inter-regional trade within the Eurasian Customs Union actually decline in the years after the annexation of Crimea. So it's not hanging its hat entirely on Russia. And uh, it's got a close relationship with China, though some of the land sale disputes were controversial. Nazarbayev being out of the picture and being moved upstairs creates kind of a tabula rasa there, a bit of a blank slate for the China-Kazakh relations. Kazakhstan is also engaging with Pakistan and India and uh, Middle Eastern countries. It's got a truly multi-vector, multipolar foreign policy, the most diversified foreign policy by far of any Central Asian country, arguably the most diversified country of all, aside from Russia, outside of the post-Soviet space. Maybe Azerbaijan is its only rival. So that's uh, an important, uh, and even Azerbaijan has got limitations in some of its partnerships because of the controversy surrounding the Karabakh issue. So Kazakhstan is really trying to be friends with everyone, trying to engage with everyone, and being overly assertive doesn't necessarily play into that. Being more of a dialogue facilitator, being more of a, a voice of caution and a voice of restraint on global issues like nuclear proliferation and regional issues like Afghan security probably plays more into its agenda. And that's why they're probably trying to be a bit more noncommittal and they're trying to uh, uh, weigh the situation more cautiously. And thirdly and finally, Kazakhstan's an important nexus in the Belt and Road Initiative. China might be even pushing Kazakhstan on the score. Kazakhstan wants external investment. Its per capita income is higher than Russia's. It's got a more open business climate now. It, the last thing it wants is to offend the Taliban and have a transnational security problem. It's happy to have that transnational security problem be the problem of Uzbekistan, be the problem of Tajikistan, and potentially Turkmenistan right now, and not having to deal with it itself. So that's probably why they're keeping a little bit of a lower profile on the Afghan issue. So let's, we've got about 10 minutes. Let's turn to the Afghan yeah. issue now, as I know that there are a few people joined today who wrote to me saying that this is the kind of topic that they're particularly in, they are especially interested in. Um, it's a, I think this, this is a good way of approaching one of the questions that has been asked. Um, but I suppose tying everything together. So is China now going to try and bring Afghanistan into the Belt and Road Initiative? And then expanding on that question, how can Beijing hope to succeed in stabilizing a country to such an in stabilizing the country rather to such an extent that it can then seek to extract business opportunities from it, considering that the Russians, the Americans, have both failed in that in that regard? What, what can China do differently in Afghanistan? These are uh, several excellent questions. I would say that uh, Afghanistan is a member of the Belt and Road, first of all. And uh, the Ghani government did dispatch a very, it's basically its main delegation, I believe, to the uh, Belt and Road Forum in 2017. So it's been strategically committed to being involved in the Belt and Road. It, as I said earlier, is a observer also within the SCO, though with the Taliban takeover, how exactly that's navigated at the next uh, major SCO summit is going to be something to watch. So Afghanistan is firmly integrated in the Chinese economic and security architecture, as well as their long-term planning and their long-term thinking. But the problem is the Belt and Road Initiative has had been something of a paradox. On the one hand, it's led to the greater integration and the more and more interactions between Chinese and Afghan officials, but it's actually resulted in less 
or at least no appreciable impact on the number or the scale of actual Chinese investments and projects inside Afghanistan. For example, the Mezzanine Copper Mine, we've been talking about that a lot. It's the second largest copper mine in the world, uh, allegedly. The uh, Chinese uh, state mining company has a $3 billion contract on. It was just being reported on uh, last week that they, with the Taliban takeover, they were in talks with some of the Taliban officials on reviving it. The problem was that contract was first signed in 2008. It was widely reported in the international press that it was on the cusp of being a done deal in 2016. And here we are, 13 years later, and uh, really not much progress has been made. It's still in the realm of hypotheticals. The uh, potential oil fields as well that were developed in 2011. I mean, there was a CFR report that lists all these projects. I believe that was the second one that they listed. Uh, is something that's uh, uh, a bit of a problem too. So China's uh, involvement with Afghanistan and the Belt and Road has been largely about pageantry and symbolism and promoting interstate interactions and is much less effective in terms of promoting actual commercial deals. In the long run, China certainly does want to see access to the rare earth metals, the lithium, the copper, and get, uses the, the three trillion dollars in resources that we believe that under the ground as a, 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 as a good starting point for its broader economic ambitions. And even though it's gotten those kind of advantages in Africa, and now it's another sphere where they probably have faced even less Western competition because of the Taliban to secure that. So the Chinese have a long-term vested interest in turning around this trend of it being all talk and no action on the Belt and Road in Afghanistan. Um, I would say the Chinese can do something differently than the Americans and the Soviets because they're getting involved not as partisan stakeholders. They've uh, established a good relationship with the Afghan government, but they also cultivated uh, assiduously a strong relationship with the Taliban ever since uh, 2013. Uh, Tianjin, uh, there was a meeting of senior Taliban officials just uh, in the summer. And the uh, idea is that the Chinese will kind of moderate the Taliban's conduct, uh, particularly with regards to transactional terrorism and get security guarantees on the East Turkestan Islamic movement in exchange for investment. And whether that's how, whether that's gonna hold, whether there's a deal like that has been signed, it's unclear, but every Chinese uh, media outlets from the South China Morning Post to more uh, domestically oriented outlets have talked about that. So that's just something that we should keep in mind. As, as something that's important. So China's apolitical posturing, their emphasis on non-interference, their abstention on the recent vote about a UN safe zone proposal that was tabled by France and Britain on, uh, on safe zone in Kabul, support for humanitarian corridors, engagement, no asset freezes, all these things, just a kind of neutrality and a kind of ability to be above the fray that the Americans and the Soviets couldn't be. The Soviets obviously supporting their Marxist uh, regime and supporting uh, Najibullah, the Americans uh, supporting uh, Ghani. The Chinese have a, have a luxury of not being defined in terms of political terms and of using that neutrality to their advantage. And that's, I think, is their single biggest advantage that they can weaponize in the future. Again, but it's all very opaque. I mean, uh, so how Shaheen, I believe, was the person, or, or was Zabiullah, uh, Zabiullah, the, uh, the, 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 the main spokesperson, Mujahid, Zabiullah Mujahid, Either or both have said that China has got no guaranteed preferential deals in Afghanistan, but they haven't ruled it out entirely. They always hedge. They say we have no plans or we have or we can't confirm that or whatever. So it's possible that there's deals under the table, but we have to look at that. But I think the long-term legacy of Chinese uh, investment with the Taliban and diplomatic uh, investment in terms of soft power and diplomatic capital will give China an advantage that the other countries don't have. And might give Russia an advantage in that sphere too, because Russia ambassador to Afghanistan Dmitry Zernov has talked about investing in the same rare earth deposits. And Russia and China's strategies of multi-vector diplomacy in Afghanistan have been almost indistinguishable in that respect, really since uh, 2015. I think the point you made about China's beginning to kind of look at Afghanistan with a new light now that it, you know, there is an opportunity for it in the country, obviously, with the US's withdrawal and the fact that, you know, NATO troops and Russia is unlikely to want to, you know, become involved again, given its history. Um, before people kind of join the conversation, we were talking offline about some of the posturing that China has um, kind of presented towards Afghanistan in its domestic media. Some of the, obviously, yeah, some of the kind of historical kind of, and kind of comparisons that have been made in Chinese media towards Afghanistan and the opportunity and the kind of the new presence and role of the Taliban. I thought that was a really interesting point that is worth expanding on for the audience because of course they missed it. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a pretty active and heated uh, public discourse obviously within China, media and social media about what's happening in the situation in Afghanistan. 
And that's something that I've been tracking uh, quite closely since the inception. In general, the primary narrative really is that this is an abdication of American leadership. And this is an abdication of American leadership that may be unparalleled since the withdrawal from Saigon. So uh, eerily similar to some of the Republican and some of the domestic critiques in the United States who are hammering away at Biden. They would never want to admit any kind of commonality with Chinese state media narratives, but they're obvious, but they're sounding a little bit like echoes of each other. That's kind of funny. Um, uh, but beyond that, I mean, beyond talking about American leadership on the wane, there's actually a, a phrase that's being used now about American uh, strategic restraint is one that's being often used. In general, talking about the uh, diminution of American leadership and the expedition of the multipolar world order. So they're seeing this as something that's going to be not just uh, present in Afghanistan, but it's replicable elsewhere. It's important to keep in mind that the Trump administration abruptly withdrew from Somalia uh, at the end of last year, really with no... Uh, a clear game plan on preserving long-term security there against Al-Shabaab. And when the African Union was caught unprepared and when local officials there were urging the U.S. to stay. Um, the U.S. Uh, really vacillated on U.N. peacekeeping missions in the Sahel, where China is heavily involved with, particularly with the terms of Mali. Uh, the U.S. is uh, pulled out of Syria pretty erratically, uh, except for the oil fields uh, under Trump's tenor. Biden is preparing for a similar withdrawal like this from Iraq, and the Chinese are basically focusing on that one and saying, what's going to happen in Afghanistan? Is Iraq's going to be the same. It may even be worse because they've got a lot of oil infrastructure to defend and a potential immediate source of financing for these terrorist groups that the Afghans don't have. So the Chinese are looking at this as a, as a defeat for American leadership, a triumph for their own model of governance and their own multipolar world order, and also a cautionary tale against color revolutions, which is a Russian phrase that the Chinese have expropriated, against uh, Western-backed regime changes, democracy promotion missions, interference in the internal affairs of states. China's non-interference, respect for sovereignty is looking pretty good right now. And that's kind of what they're trying to emphasize and show. The Chinese foreign policy is pragmatic and also a lot more kind of bulletproof against this kind of catastrophic scenario. Looking beyond and taking a level deeper, you're seeing uh, two real parallel narratives about the Taliban takeover coming forward. In, on the Chinese social media circles, there's a lot of angst, there's a lot of anxiety about engaging with a regime like the Taliban, not least because of its history of, um, of ties to um, the TIM and, and, and transnational terrorism, but also just its, uh, it, its, its human rights care record, its, uh, its suppression of women's rights, its uh, hardline Islamism, just seems to dovetail and, and not dovetail at all with the values that the CCP has been promoting all these decades. So people see a values-based uh, fight over here, but there's a growing subsection, I think that they, you know, more, that's more on the social media discourse from the state line media discourse, which actually is showing the Taliban in somewhat of a positive light. Like for example, there was one state media commentary that struck me quite a bit. And I think that Wang Jiwei was one of the experts who was talking about it. And there was also a state media commentary that built on it that basically made it a historical analogy between the Taliban as a resistance force, like Cao Cao, the rebels and the warlords who overthrew the corrupt Han dynasty. So making analogies towards uh, uh, past uh, overthrows of corrupt regimes in China, basically arguing that the Taliban's move is really just to cleanse the country and make it in terms of anti-corruption. Even if by comparing them to Cao Cao was a notorious warlord and he was quite brutal in his tactics, they may be heavy handed, they may be brutish, they may be strong armed, but they're actually maybe doing something good for in terms of Afghanistan in terms of reforming it. So that's something that we should, uh, we should watch and see which narrative really takes hold on the Taliban takeover. And finally, they will, the Chinese will be breathing a sigh of relief about the American withdrawal because they, like the Russians, have viewed the American presence in, in Afghanistan as a way to keep a check on the Belt and Road, to obstruct, obstruct CPAC, obstruct Chinese uh, investments in Central Asia, gain access to the mineral reserves themselves. The Russians presented in more cruder neo imperial terms. The Chinese tend to focus it on more in, in terms of sabotaging their projects. But both will be relieved that the Americans are gone. Uh, because that will kind of alleviate an external check and an external source of pressure on the BRI's expansion if the Taliban, and that's a big if, can't avoid a civil war with the resistance forces in Panjir Valley and against other opposition factions, create a, a semi-inclusive coalition government, and actually create authoritarian stability or totalitarian stability in Afghanistan in contrast to the uh, unchecked violence that we've seen over the past four decades. So China might actually view the law of the American withdrawal as a short-term risk, obviously, because the security vacuum is being created, but a long-term benefit to some of its uh, Belt and Road projects. So that just sums up the Chinese discourse on Afghanistan and different views that I've been seeing from the Chinese side. 
Well, thanks, Tom. I've realized that time has really got away with us and we've, you know, reached the hour mark. And I'm aware that particularly people in the UK have to get, you know, back to their mornings. And this has been a really, really interesting conversation and one that I think, you know, has really set people up to now reevaluate the Belt and Road, China's foreign policy in Central Asia, and kind of got everybody up to date on what is taking place in the rapidly evolving situation in Afghanistan, particularly where China is involved. I had so many more questions, but we, we won't have the time. So Sam, thanks for joining us this, this afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, it was really great to be here. And given that we didn't have much time to focus on China and Afghanistan, and I know there was interest in it from the audience, I will now shamelessly plug um, the podcast for China Business Brief. Sam was on the latest episode doing a deep dive into kind of China's um, kind of opinion on its new neighbors in Kabul in the Taliban. Um, so do go and check that out. We have loads of other podcast episodes on a whole range of topics, be they political, business, and sectoral for you to enjoy as well. Um, but, you know, join us in the future for more events. Uh, and in two weeks time, is two weeks time, we will be having our first virtual meeting with the new Chinese ambassador, Zhang Zeguang. Uh, a couple of days afterwards, we have the first of our targeting net zero events and how the UK and China can work together in this regard. The day after is the return of CB Insights, where we will be having a session on Chinese corporate health and credit risk, particularly looking at whether or not the bonds defaults of major Chinese SOEs presents as a threat to the broader economy. Then there is a business dialogue with the Shenzhen Municipal Government in our business dialogue series. Do contact our Government Affairs Director, Jeff Wang, for more information there. And then towards the end of the month, we will be having a premium member briefing with Trade Commissioner John Edwards in Beijing. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks again, Sam. And I hope to see you at another CBBC event soon. Goodbye. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I think people will, it's always awkward towards the end of events as people drop off. Um, but no, thanks, yeah. thanks, thanks, Sam, for joining. This, that was a really informative session. I mean, as I said, as I joked, I'm really glad that I was recording this because it's just such, it's just so interesting to hear what you have to say about all of these areas. And it's such a good kind of foundational kind of remind grounder in what is taking place. And it's so cool. Yeah, there's so much happening here. And there was a lot to explain in some of these questions. So I try my best to cover as much as possible, but yeah. And I feel, I feel guilty. I should, I, sh I should in future for Ask the Analyst sessions, send a prompt saying, make sure that you have a cup of tea or some sort of beverage available. Um, yeah. Because I did feel guilty asking you so many questions. So in such a short amount of time. There was one question actually that went unanswered. It's by somebody named Howard Jung. I don't know whether he had his contact. It was yeah, he, he, Howard is a colleague of ours and actually is still online. So Howard. Oh, great. So I, I would like to yeah. maybe just later today, send him an email with a, with a short response to that. Well, if you've like got time that. and Howard, you're still online and you can't speak. But I mean, the question was, is there yeah. kind of opportunity for the UK and China to work right. together in Afghanistan? Yeah, so if you can pass on his email or whatever, I can just write something. Uh, All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I will let you get back to your morning and yeah. we'll speak again soon. For sure. Yeah, definitely, Jeff. Oh, well, enjoy Oxford for me. I miss Thank it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.